thank you, Clara. Um, I was talking to Clara that let's try and keep our time because the best part, which is the panel discussion, we all do want to have an hour of panel discussions. So let's start with our first paper in the section Trans Mexico Lingua Querido, which is Mexican scenes, representations of Mexico City in the new cinema. And Maria Moreno is going to give the speech. Good afternoon and thank you, Clara, for inviting me. You are going to be seeing a lot of me today, I'm sorry. Um, good afternoon again. Um, I will be presenting two papers, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I am the co-author of this one and I'm the only one here to present. So um, this is called Mexican Scenes, Representations of Mexico City in the New Cinema. So uh, Mexico has, sorry. Mexico has one of the most prolific and critically acclaimed film industries in the world. Films such as Amores Perros, El Crimen del Padre Amaro, and Into Mama Tambien have captured an international Im imagination and regained Mexico's reputation for quality scripts and production values. Mexican films and directors have won numerous awards and been nominated the, uh, in nominations for in short leads, while actors such as Hasalma Hayek and Gal Gael Garcia Bernal have become regulars at international festivals and on the red carpets. The Senate was reached in 2007 when Mexican film projects received 16 Oscar nominations. Leading Mexican directors have worked on films recognized and no as not Mexican or global productions, such as Guillermo del Toro, Pat Labyrinth uh, and Hellboy, Alfonso Cuaron, Children of Men, and Gonzalez Iñari through 21 Grams and Babel. Mexican film has joined a limited court of what might be considered transnational cinemas that arguably includes Brazil, China, Argentina, and India. But a new age of golden uh, cinema has taken shape and attention has focused on whatever the the time-worn visual and narrative styles of the national genre has given way to more transnational approach and feel. Although the golden age, broadly dating from 1930s to the late 50s, was never hermetically national as it often represented, subsequent transnational cultural flows and economic globalization have made this idea of contemporary film fitting national paradigms and holding an essential specificity, oddly anachronistic, these processes do not only affect how film is produced, financed, and disseminated, but also the subject matter themselves and their cinematic treatment. Mexico has itself become significantly more transnational, more or less co news with the emergence of the new new cinema, and particularly notable features has been the emergence of transnational spaces within Mexican cities, typified by the mega projects, export zones, malls, and historic downtowns. In this work, we use film, or rather cinematic space, as a tool with which to analyze contemporary Mexico City, the local for the majority of uh, new cinema. The cinematic treatment of cities, it's an important medium for how audiences and academics imagine the urban experience. Two key points are the pin th this uh, work. First, considering the contemporary city for film exposes a methodological dilemma not adequately uh, addressed in urban studies. If, as many academic studies have assumed, representations of place are produced by legitimate social relations of power and hence reflect and form identifiable ide ideologies, then film is an important component of our ideas of place. Yet, both film itself and political economy of the city have become more global or transnational, so that the neat idea of representations are produced of a, spell, uh, of a place from a place breaks down. Transnational um, cinema's representations of Mexico City does not simply rely on how cinema sees the city, but also how the city sees itself uh, being formed in transnational processes. 
The representations of Mexico City, therefore, are both response to different mores in film and of shift of the form of, and the idea of the city. Second, as the cinema and the city have become transnational, uh, so how films are seen reflects a transnational eye on the city. The audience is no longer a national or regional one, nor it's an international one that has the same acceptance of national tropes or storylines or portrayals. As Garcia Canclini has suggested, the film industry is implicated in the production of the local through the transnational processes that require territorialization. Sorry. The uh, folkloric is at once attenuated and made generic through transnational manifestations, and the importance of embedded and local becomes more important become more important. But the transnational idea of Mexico City is far less likely to be that of the folkloric Mexico of valientes, machos, and indigenous women, caught up in emotionally um, charged melodramas set against backdrops of colonial buildings or perhaps the modern city. The transnational visions of the local has changed and is likely to understand Mexico and Mexico City as a space of violence, drug, poverty, with congested and polluted cities, industrial and the de industrialized landscapes, as well as a space of chic elites and consumption. Cinema has in part informed this vision. The cinematic representation of the city has provided its own accounts, independent of the city as it might really be, or even how others imagine it. In the process of making and watching film, Holy new understands of the city and of the city are produced. As such, film can destabilize urban meanings through the formation of others. The work is organized in three sections. In the first, we are going to outline the, the re-emergence of Mexican film industry to, the, to a leading position in transnational cinema. We briefly outline how transnational cinema suggests a number of different registers the organization of the industry, their relation with diasporic audiences, and most important, the reworking of a national aesthetic style for international consumption. In the second, we discuss how the city has been treated in the golden age cinema of the 40s and 50s, a set of key tropes of representation. The third, third section analyzes a number of contemporary films, in part to follow these tropes, but also to identify New signs are related this to the changing structure of, from Mexico City. Our aim is to consider in what ways the cinematic representation relate to transnational views of the city. Film production of five features length films in, 60, in 1926 and 38. In 1941 by the, and 1950, Mexican studios were releasing over 120 films. The nationalist cinema of the 30s that attempted to capture the spirit of post-revolutionary age to the Nuevo Cine of the 60s created important cultural icons that still reign in popular culture, as is the case of Cantinflas, Pedro Infante, Jorge Neglete, Maria Félix, and Dolores del Rio. Both film exported and constructed at home uh, created a national identity with repeated representations of the peasant girl, the heroic char character, and the fated prostitute becoming synonymous with Mexican film and the national character. Nevertheless, the majority of films produced in this time were par partially financed by the Banco Nacional Cinematográfico and later by the Mexican Film Institute, which issued its financial influence and co-production in a climate of political censorship to limit cinema as an outlet for criticism. A combination of state control and economic austerity marked the 80s as perhaps the last dynamic era in Mexican film. Despite the breakthrough of Como Agua para Chocolate in 92, the economic crisis of 94 to 96 forced production to fall to less than 10 films and domestic cinema um, audiences members continued to drop. From the late 90s, however, Mexican film production was about to enter a new, new golden um, age. Films such as Sexo, Pudor y Lágrimas, La Ley de Herodes, and Todo el Poder appeared to critically acclaim, even if they remained unknown to largely domestic and Latin American audiences. A subsequent branch of films, however, confirmed Mexican films to, as a box office gold, 
Among these groups, we have uh, Amores Perros, uh, Y Tu Mama También, De La Calle, Batalla en el Cielo, and Silent Light. These films were nominated for and won a host of international awards, both in the US and Europe. A range of factors probably explain the shift. The relation of financial controls and privatization of the banking system coincide with the emergence of, uh, emergence of small private production companies, many of which had gained technical expertise in advertising and personally trained abroad. These private production and distribution companies, encumbered by the uh, overheads of the larger studios, as well versed in the demands of commercial cinema were attractive conduits for financial support from field companies, banks and governments in Spain, France, and the UK. By 2000, the majority of Mexico's best known films are predominantly financed privately and mostly from abroad. Although the domestic cinema market in, Mexi in Mexico has responded to the renaissance of production and being Mexico the fifth largest market in the world, most films on show are international and mostly US blockbusters. Indeed, during the 90s, the domestic cinema ma market restructured with the closure of many small independent houses and large multiplex chains have appeared. The vast majority of Mexican films are, are neither distributed within or without of, uh, Mexico to any considerable degree. Domestic output represents only about 10% of films distributed. Mostly, we showed at the handful of cinemas and on university campus or film festivals. Filmmakers and backers, however, are aware of the potential of Mexico as a global brand. In the key US markets, the new, new cinema has moved Mexican films out of the niche, catering to Spanish-speaking audiences or art houses crowd, and competing with films from Brazil, India, Turkey, or China to the main screen complexes. The diasporic Mexican and global audiences hold a complex imagina imagination of what Mexican means as a cinematic space. Appreciation of the golden age um, melodrama through a niche has acquired new audiences and meanings through the internet, giving such actors as Maria Felix and Dolor Dolores de Rio post-mortem careers. Through the representations of Mexico and Mexicans remains highly contentious a uh, convenient order through which Hollywood films have easily supply of bodies in the guise of da dictators, lazy peasants, and more recently drug and child traffickers, kidnappers, and corrupt politicians. As Cerna shows, Hollywood's representation of a bar barbaric, sexualized, and picturesque Mexico has been long time annoyance to both the Mexican government and Mexicans in the US, concerned with how the patria was represented. Little critique emerged, however, of how Mexico represented itself that could not be controlled through censorship. The new, age, uh, of go the new golden age represented a set of films through which Mexico might represent itself a different Mexico from that of the 40s and 50s, coming to terms with the aftermath of revolution, industrial change, and urbanization. How would the films of transnational cinema represent a neoliberal and transnational Mexico? In particular, how would it communicate ideas of the Mexican city? Would it offer new insights, constructs, original narratives, convey different outlooks through cinematic technique, or rely on reinventing established tropes with a contemporary twist? Mexico City, at the time of the 40s and 50s golden age of Mexican cinema, already had a population of over 3 million people and was undergoing rapid urban growth and industrial change. The small workshops and large factories of the city's core and the north, to the north were being overtaken by industrial parks. The fabric of the colonial and 19th century city was being extended with platted suburbs. The tenements, vecindades, remained and were now added to purpose-building apartment blocks, and the ciudades perdidas, mostly in areas close to industry and major infrastructure. These were the, con the counterpoints to the audience, uh, to the audacious modernist architecture of Mario Pani and Luis Barbagan, adorned with the syncretic designs of Carlos Merida, David Alfaro Silqueiros, and Juan O'Gorman, and accompanied by large scale public works programs, especially in roads, health, and education. 
Films such as Esquina Bajan, Maldita Ciudad, A Nosotros Los Pobres, Scrutinize, The Directions and Quality of Industrialization, State Urban Projects and Consumer Culture, and often pitch the indigenous migrant as a counterposition to the erudite, erudite urbanite. Through not all film could be classified as melodrama, the use of long emotional silences or inner thoughts and tensions communicated through songs were as much a figure of the urban films as to the rural. rural. Um, so, sorry, I have to skip a part of the paper. So, um, as going, um, I'm going to skip a part and go to the revisited cinematic city. As Hugo Lara has observed, Mexican cinema has been a great mirror of the city in which the films of the past 30 years have captured all the transformations of the city and its inhabitants, their emotions, and their dreams and joys. A key tenement has been with the changing nature of the city during the process of neoliberalization and globalization. In Solo con tu pareja, Alfonso Cuaron explores Mexico City as the height of the Salinas neoliberal reforms and without knowing it to the cost of the NAFTA and the Zapatist response. The main protagonists are middle class and professional hip, sexually liberated and extreme confidence. The film is set near to downtown with the city represented and, uh, as an exciting, creative and vibrant space. Cuaron City is now over 20 million people. Coming to terms with urbanization is no longer a realistic motif. The challenge has become to, term, to come to terms with globalization and social relations amidst cosmopolitanism. Amores Perros offers a similar reprise of neoliberalism and in particular of the neoliberal city. Podansky claims that neoliberalism is not directly reflected by the film, a point we disagree with. The viewer is asked to make numerous references to the past. A central character, El Chivo, is a former revolutionary who gave up his middle class lifestyle and family for a set of values, a decision he now bitterly regrets and as he survives as an assassin. The idea of the past has been replaced by individualistic and mercenary activity in a market economy of violence. Yes, yet we can observe more direct references to neoliberalism in Amores Perros, most obviously in the car career of Adimis Valeria, the model whose life is a series of facades. If we consider Amores Perros, Batalla en el Cielo, and La Zona, all three uh, films, the, uh, the directors and writers offer a generic story that is embedded with contemporary Mexican society and the city. Yet, in an interview conducted in 2000, González Iñárritu argued that Amores Perros was a very universal story because it is a very local story. I never really show Mexico City in the film, he says, but people who've been there tell me they could smell Mexico City in the film. At one level, therefore, Mexico City serves for what the loose calls in space whatever. A city like any other in the world, not because all cities have the same, but because of the similarities of the urban condition. In an interview, Carlos Raigadas made a similar remark that geography is unimportant. I felt I could be in Lithuania or Africa or whenever, he said. The cinematography underscores that the any space whatever element in the old three films. The city is vis visually anonymous in some important ways. In Amores Perros, for example, there is no use of buildings, monuments, or paintings shots that indicate that Mexico City is, or which parts of the, uh, or, uh, or any uh, parts of the city. In La Zona, a certain anywhere-ness is provided by the architectural references. Houses and streets resemble any recent US suburb, but also similarities with gated communities elsewhere in Latin America. Batalla does offer glimpses of a recognizable city. Most scenes are shot in Polanco and Lomas, and there are settings um, across, uh, scenes set in the Metro and the Zocalo and the Basilica. But something different is going on there. The relation to the iconographic city serves as a hi highlight uh, the traumas of Carlos, the Catholic and proud Mexica. These three films also show the female characters in recent film perform more complicated and certainly more ambivalent roles. In La Zona, they play moral compass against the violence of the residents and eventually the police. In Amoris, the seemingly empowered Valeria becomes a pale reflection of her earlier self after the crash, anxious and in, uh, closing her flat. And other female characters 
uh, are depicted as weak and unknowing, dominated by men and their responsibilities as mothers and housewives in Amores Perros. Urban fragmentation runs in parallel with social breakdown. Indeed, among the three films, there is a uh, variable rock gallery of characters from all levels of Mexican society, living dysfunctional lives, states that do not function as they should, and social frictions. According to Iñárritu, Amores Perros is an exploration of how Mex why Mexican society has lost our fraternity. The contemporary cinematic treatment of the city still revolves around the relations of place and identity. Drawing upon Principio and Fin and De La Calle, um, contains claims that a slow and unpredictable dismantling of the structure which gives uh, legibility to notions of identity and place and the city, coupled with the search of, for meaning on behalf of the protagonists, which drives them into a doom quest of um, lost origins. Cinematic representations of cities are not objective accounts showing how the city really is, and their careful uh, crafted method of undermines their approach as more immediate and alive presentations of daily life. Rather, film offers specific imaginations of the city, sometimes deliberately chosen and conscious aesthetics and form which particular meanings can be unpacked, and sometimes a general sense, sense of sight in which is worked out by the audiences. This later interaction between the film and the audiences is especially powerful as the gaze of both immediacy and moving image and opportunity for, for reflection. We do not wish to suggest that Mexican new cinema represents a genre of its own right, although it is intriguing to consider the quality of films as representing a corpus of work. There is no consistency in the points of origin or narratives of the city that represent while most films pick up on motifs in popular culture and concern common terms, most notably violence, sexual relations, and often insights into contemporary urbanism, we hesitate to suggest that an emergent Mexican noir, despite the anomaly, trauma, and feelings of displacement, the breakdown of conventional relations with other locales um, of the city, the city itself is shown as a more complex backdrop and subject to the movies. Against the noir aesthetic of thrown down and silly spaces, dark inner cities illuminated by flickering neon and traffic, the shimmer of crime, Mexico City is shown for the most part to the world as an opposite of the image of the and after and the room to the ecological Hiroshima. Thank you. Gracias. Vamos agora. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's. <laughs> Macarena <laughs> and the transnational meanings of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Buenas tardes. Um, I guess there are a couple of dangers in uh, going this late in the conference. The first is that everything's been said. Um, so I'm hoping I can say, add to that. And I think the question of religion and religiosity hasn't been brought up, so that's one kind of uh, addition. The other danger I have is representing the conference convener. Um, so I'm actually going to ask Clara, thank you so much for inviting us, um, but also to join me for the Q&A. Um, so this paper actually comes out of a couple of different projects that we've been working on. Um, and I wanted to contextualize another project first and talk kind of arc, uh, harking back to some of what was said yesterday about global tourism as an act of travel for pleasure, um, a lot of movement, um, and embedded in a colonial economy at the global scale. And often in terms of decision making, local communities lose power. And also, um, you know, there's not, that, not too much accountability. And again, this idea of empire or unequal exchange. Well, Glad and I were very much working on the idea of local tourism in another paper in contrast to kind of global tourism as a structure to think about a different form of tourism. Um, and I promise I won't do this irritating scroll the whole time. But first, I wanted to think of this idea of bounded tourism as one that um, it has a complex relationship to local communities. And we think of bounded tourism as corporate-owned spaces with public functions that really capitalize upon the idea of longing or nostalgia for homeland. And 
for us in California, in the context of Plaza Mexico, which I'm going to be talking about today, um, increasingly it's impossible to return home. You have this very difficult context of the impossibility of return, especially because of the U.S.-Mexico border being increasingly fortified, immigrants being increasingly surveilled, the danger of crossing itself, dehydration, deportation sweeps that were talked about so eloquently yesterday, and a general kind of anti-immigrant political environment, which makes it very, very different for people to, um, to be mobile, and so the idea of being stuck in a place, right? So in this sense, Plaza Mexico in another paper we talked about is a new form of venture capitalism that really targets ethnic market niches and especially transnational subjects that are bound by place. So Plaza Mexico, um, you know, I'll talk about in a second, but it's, it's really a mall. And in this paper, instead of focusing on bounded tourism, we really want to talk about transnational connect connectivity and how it happens beyond a sphere of quantifiable economic and political arenas to describe some of the qualitative cultural manifestations of transnational experience. We're really interested in this idea then of cultural religiosity. But Plaza Mexico, again, is a site of local tourism, as a model of regional and national architecture, which I'll go into. And if most of you, I guess, are familiar with Los Angeles, it's located off the 105 freeway um, in a, pop, uh, a community of 85% and upwards um, Mexican population. And an important point here that I think that kind of intersects with what Miriam was talking about yesterday uh, and different, that there's a real desire to appropriate national companies, Cafe Canela, instead of Starbucks, for instance, and a kind of push back on Starbucks and other uh, transnational or corporations. Um, and interestingly, it's Korean owned, okay? But it actually uh, caters to be authentically Mexican. So. Um, you don't get a very good sense of it here, but the kind of construction of the place is very uh, faux architecture, a lot of parking. In the center, you get a sense of a kind of Mexico City Plaza space and very much trying to replicate certain elements of Mexico City, which I'll detail in a second. Um, so the place here is really about kind of uh, this idea of cultural re religiosity, which we describe as forms of expressive spiritual practices and celebrations that bridge communal ties between nations of origins and destination to create transnational experience. The other concept we really want to think about is affective connectivity. These are ongoing and persistent um, forms of exchange to indicate experience. So here we're really interested in looking at two sets of celebrations, the Virgen de Guadalupe and um, Dia de los Muertes, Muertos to, to talk about what happens in this place. Um, our objectives in the paper are really to capture heterogeneity, and I'm really interested in what Juan Pobleto, Pobleto the critical theorist, talks about, is the difficulty that we have as social um, theorists, we're challenged by this expanded social imagination where we can't really fully incorporate migration and transnationalism within our horizon of theory. And so that's one aspect of it. But second, we want to follow Veronis um, in two, 2007, who really describes the ways that pan-Latino identity is constructed through place, and we want to use ethnographic analysis and spatial analysis to demonstrate the ways in which Mexicans use placemaking strategies to present and uh, produce a world of their own. Um, so here we're thinking of Plaza Mexico as a really dense research site where transnational processes play themselves out in the vernacular, it offers a unique location from which to really think and discuss the dynamics of cross-border cultural activities, cross-border imaginaries in a metropolitan area with an expansive Latino population. Finally, we're interested in really uh, expanding and vitalizing an understanding of cultural religious practices in space in the contemporary period. So if spaces themselves of ethnic and cultural identity have often been theorized by focusing on very local places, such as the home, the street, the neighborhood, then it is also because traditionally these are the concrete places where ethnic communities are formed and where cu cultural identities maintain its strongest ties. But we want to kind of um, debunk this idea and think more carefully that space, culture, and identity are shifting from the kind of traditional notion of el barrio and being displaced into privatized locations, but whether or not our question is whether these private locations can also serve as kind of semi-public and public spaces that actually do something to kind of uh, 
um, strength in social networks. So again, it's a Korean-owned, Mexican-themed outdoor mall, uh, Plaza Mexico, and um, it's, uh, I think, important because a lot of people go there to celebrate El Grito de la Independencia, Mexico Independence Day. Um, P uh, thousands of people went for the 2006 World Cup. Uh, it corrals large crowds on Sundays when patrons stroll around and enjoy regional Mexican cuisine, shop and participate in plaza programming, including Catholic masses. So in a way, Catholic masses, the, it also displaces the function of the, the Catholic church by having a public space where people actually worship in the middle of a mall, frankly. Um, and also in Plaza Mexico, it's important because a lot of the, it's the home of hometown associations like that of Oaxaca, Puebla, and Michoacán. And these are kind of community centers that provide key legal business and cultural services for immigrants of those regions in Mexico. And a location that nearly um, all Mexican government officials and actresses visit when in Los Angeles for election campaigning or other business. So it's a site that people actively cultivate as part of a transnational political imaginary as well. In fact, the owners and managers of Plaza Mexico have worked very carefully to craft a distinctive role for Plaza Mexico in catering to Los Angeles Latinos, specifically targeting Mexicano immigrants and their multifold material and affective needs and desires. As one manager briefly commented to us, um, this is not Placita Olvera. Here, the clientele is 100%, 100% Latino. So this is about the ability to really capture the imagination of the local Latino diaspora and a primary strategy of the managers of Plaza Mexico has been to create, expand, and capture the clientele through cultural programming, as I mentioned before. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that the forms of cultural connection are really structurally facilitated by the management of the place. Um, so it fulfills the kind of mall and economic and market imperative. But we also are interested in, in suggesting, um, I think as you know, other people said yesterday, we're not only wanting to analyze in economic terms because we think that misses much of the richness and significance of cultural life, but we're also interested in thinking about transnational persistence and continuities of culture um, and celebrations like those that I mentioned earlier. So these are places where there's both fetishized expression of religion that spread through neoliberal capitalism, but also retain some very local and important rich elements of, of culture. And I want to kind of build here on Vasquez and, and Mar uh, McCart, um, 2003, to argue that religion really has always provided complex strategies for conceptualizing self, conceptualizing time and space, and must be really taken seriously as an independent variable in the present. Um, and a fruitful way to really understand this is all through, also through Julian Holloway's work, which offers a vitalized understanding of the spiritual and religious practices, one that really accounts for the importance of enchanted space. And Holloway suggests that these are places where secular and religious dimensions work together in polyphonic ways. And in fact, I think the Day of the Dead is a really important um, way, way where this mall is absolutely transformed by enchanted space. That is, people put up their altars. Um, there's all kinds of, from Nazarit, we've, we met elders, we met shaman who actually give blessings there. And the mall is literally transformed by these regional places and ex re religious expressions. But you can see how it becomes a kind of public forum for events. And um, Again, this question of authenticity really comes forward. The managers uh, are very knowledgeable and um, consider themselves to be con connoisseurs of Mexican culture in many ways. So they've created all these replicas. Here is the Angel de la Independencia from Mexico City. And one of our informants comment to, commented to us, she was an elderly woman, she said, trajeron el angel acá? You know, she confused and actually thought that the angel was brought from Mexico City. So this creation of both a reproduction of elements from, from Mexico, um, but also, you know, where people actually feel that they can be in their country and that kind of layered response. Um, this is also a, a lot of Aztec symbols throughout. So Dia de los Muertos becomes a, an important um, way in which people come in and actually do both political work and religious or spiritual kind of significant work 
And it was interesting during much of the Dia de los Muertos celebrations um, that we also talked with people about the ways in which they uh, were also using this to express politics through anti-immigrant um, acts and, um, and also to talk about you know, those who had been killed crossing the border. So it becomes this very complex religious political dynamic. Um, the Virgen de Guadalupe uh, celebration is what we spend most time on in the paper. And I guess what I would say here is the desire again by the managers to create something authentic. Um, as manager Cristina Aguilar told us, La Virgen was actually brought, they have a, a replica of the Virgen de Guadalupe um, and, and installed in a specific place, and I don't have a picture of it today, but in a specific place in Plaza Mexico on December 12, 2002, after an exhaustive study and approval by Mexican church officials and a blessing ceremony by Father Jesus Soto Alvarado, the head of the Mexico City Basilica. So, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe is people come, they give offerings to her there, but then she's everywhere around the plaza. We, we have cite many sightings of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Her apparition is literally everywhere, and it's also very much a part of the iconography of the location. Um, and at the same time, it's an opportunity for these regional associations and a notion of regional identity to have a sense. Um, of itself and often also a place for transgenerational transmission of cultural identity um, through the posadas, the seven days during um, December 12th. How am I doing on time? Pretty good? Okay, good. Um, so, you know, it, it's been interesting to do, we had a team of people that we worked with, we did ethnography ourselves, worked with graduate students, and one really telling moment was when I was talking with five Central Americans, um, one of which was Mexicano, but Salvadoran, Guatemalan, and what they call halfies, and uh, people from mostly in the Pico Union area, um, and they were describing the way they'd come to Plaza Mexico to escape their barrio, as a place of security, as a place to actually feel a sense of cohesion to something. Some uh, Two of them told me they had just gotten out of jail, and, and I asked, well, why this place? And they said, mira, look at, you know, I'm carrying the Virgen de Guadalupe. I've come here to give her thanks, to honor her, um, but also to cruise girls, you know, to hang out as a, as a real kind of vitalized space for them that they said they don't feel safe in their barrio. So this in some ways, again, replaces um, the, the idea of the barrio. And again, the idea of the Virgen taking care of us, she's good to us, and it's important to show up here and honor her. So place becomes this actual expression of some kind of notion of kind of contemporary spirituality. Um, so I guess one of our questions is, is very much what kinds of identities are performed here? And you know, the Virgen de Guadalupe sits as a national symbolic that's been hybridized, that's been transnationalized, that becomes a political emblem that people wear not only on themselves, obviously, but it's graffiti and also as a tattoo. I think it's also important to think about it as um, how it works in this particular commercial venue. One way that it works is um, it sat kind of uncomfortably, the image, alongside the white Santa Claus within the Plaza Mexico and as a neon kind of consumer image and along, like I said, Santa Claus and the elves. And so one could ask, is this really uh, an interesting, you know, revelation or is it more a part of kind of consumer cap capitalist integration of everything that's out there. So that's been one of our questions. So in one sense, I think the forms of identity that Plaza Mexico makes available could be labeled essentialist, whether either a Mexicano identity is made legible through nationalist symbols and celebrations, or pan-Latino identity is connected through the marketplace and held relatively stable by other relational identities. However, what really surprised us most in our interviews what, was that despite the obvious architectural efforts to recreate Mexicanness in the mall, resulting in a clearly pastiche and postmodern place, almost all of the patrons asserted to us that Plaza Mexico indeed felt like the homeland. A term that consistently came up in our fieldwork was its quote unquote authenticity, which is was strange to us, but it seemed authentically Mexican to clientele in its food, its plaza design, especially among the celebration of events such as Day of the Dead and Virgen de Guadalupe. Um, so let me see. With, so really we wanted to think about this place as within the contemporary reduction of, of public spaces that are available within Los Angeles and because of 
increasing privatization um, in the last 20 years, and especially in the city, uh, places like the Grove, another mall, and Hollywood and Highland shopping malls have really become the hearts of leisure activities in the urban metropolis. And in the case of Plaza Mexico, its rise as a popular destination among an almost exclusively Latino clientele is due to the marketing of cultural authenticity, producing this place as linked tradi to traditional Mexican heritage. And it becomes then ma about mass consumer ethnic tastes and political orientations. But in fact, it's, it's interesting again to note the degree to which it's used as a space of demonstration. For example, in 2006, during the anti-immigrant legislation, students who actually walked out of their high schools congregated here for their rallies. And it's interesting that they chose this as the site of their political contestation. And there's been many other instances, uh, you know, in terms of both social movements that are conservative and more progressive. Anti-Minutemen uh, rallies have been here, but there have also been attempts to actually hold Minutemen rallies there um, in terms of kind of the questions around immigrant rights. I think we want to argue that unlike the Grove or Hollywood and Highland, the cultural politics that emerge are really tied to a, an inherent political difference or a marginalized status of immigrants and that these are expressions become important kind of cultural artistic elements that challenge easy notions of Mexicanidad. And some displays incorporate critiques of US government, critiques of empire and racism, and really show up in, in a lot of kind of different places. Um, I don't have images to, to ground that. Um, OK, so within the restricted space of consumption, Plaza Mexico provides a setting of expanding possibilities, uh, including a Mexican theme environment that creates a kind of inspiring background for cultural and religious ritual. And really, it's the, perhaps the most important effect of the expressions um, are not necessarily distinct from the many celebrations that are, occur around the US, but certainly facilitated by a large scale production of programming in the mall. And um, as a plaza visitor, Ana Guzman said in front of the Oaxacan altar, we come here, we put bread and flowers and treats for our dead to show our young children what it means to be from Oaxaca. And that, you know, really her comment indicates that one of the most salient aspects of how it facilitates the making of identity is through, again, this intergenerational transmission where culture becomes an opportunity and a strategy of maintenance of national and regional identity. So just to, um, move to closing then. Um, these are some other, you know, Azteca dance, of course. Um, so some of the positive aspects is space for gathering, form of local tourism, cultural space, transnational linkages, and revitalized religion. And of course, there's more negative aspects as well. Um, you know, not clear that any of the profit is actually going back to the community or that, you know, most people, there's no public transportation that arrives there. Um, although that's changing, I think. And, you know, is it just a Mexican version of the malls that we know? The stereotypical aspects of some of the kind of pastiche notions, and does it feed off nostalgia for commercial rather than social and political ends? Well, I guess in, in, in many ways, I would suggest that, um, you know, this is not so much a question of, of assimilation. We really want to rethink these locations as you know, places that facilitate something, and to kind of follow Garcia Canclini, who explains that the market can actually produce heterogeneous outcomes that actually shape social identities and identif uh, identifications in a positive direction. I think that we found that um, that the market itself can feel like home, and it also facilitates something that sociologists like to talk about as segmented assimilation to their host nation, whereby immigrants selectively preserve traits from their regional and national cultures while adopting more mainstream American ones as they deem appropriate. But I'd even extend this to say that, you know, um, on the one hand, it does produce this, but it also can reinforce class and race boundaries. And, but at the same time, there's a, like I've said many times, there's a, perhaps an opportunity for new kinds of social action. And in increasingly privatized spaces, it's been interesting to find the ways in which perhaps this is a place that retains authenticity in a way that we don't see in other locations. So that's it. Thank you. OK, now I'll call Maria.
Morena again for her second paper, Constructing New Geographies, the Santa Fe Mega Project in Mexico City. Thank you, I hope to do better this time. <laughs> okay, um, so let's see how it all started. Where can I build my Manhattan? Was the question posed by Carlos Han Gonzalez in discussing the creation of a space in, Mexican, in Mexico City that would symbolize global corporate power to the world. The idiosyncratic nature of the question reflects both the regente or major desire for such a space as well as the way in which the project was uh, subject to the influences of power um, of the city's elite. The process of considering various sites for this mega project led to the selection of the Santa Fe garbage dump in order to build Gonzalez's Manhattan. There were a number of actions taken by different administrations. The consequences of these actions will be analyzed through the present work. Uh, we will argue that the production of the built environment is heavily conditioned by narratives of power, not only from the state, but from economic elites as well. In the case of Santa Fe, we will analyze how Mexico City's government followed the not unusual approach of undertaking urban initiatives in authoritarian manner by means of top-down urban planning. Consequently, the events which occurred, as we will learn, were evident and predictable from the beginning as the dissociation between plans and realities come into play. Authoritarianism on the part of the government inevitably required some negotiation and agreement with sectors of the civil society illustrating the degree to which the implementation of transnational urbanism is restricted to local circumstances. The main purpose of this work is to investigate mega projects uh, from a point of view that understand them as negotiated sites in which people from diverse sectors of, the so of society actively appropriate, contest, influence, and determine the outcome of a given mega project which engenders globalization. This work will analyze the personal narratives of power constructed by the elites as well as the constraints presented by particular local circumstances. Um, uh, the origins were in the early 1980s. Oh, sorry. Uh, when um, the site chosen for the Santa Fe Mega Project uh, had an area close to eight square um, kilometers. And um, from the beginning, the project was conceived as a public-private partnership. And Manuel Camacho, regente of the city from 88 to 93, claimed to have been the author of the idea of turning Santa Fe into an edged city. Santa Fe is one of the few areas in the city um, where development started with a master plan. It can be considered a real estate development uh, orchestrated by the government. The um, agency in charge was Servicios Metropolitanos or Servimet. In the years from 82 to 88, Mexico had several economic problems. The economic crisis uh, drastically slowed down the development of all urban mega projects, which explained why the construction of Santa Fe came to a virtual st still standing during these years. However, two important steps for the later development of the area were taken. The closing of the garbage dump and the building of the freeway that connected two of the city's avenues, Constituyentes and Reforma, with the freeway to Toluca. Uh, the presidential promise of uh, President Carlos Salinas de Gortari was to transform Mexico into a first world nation. He decided to further liberalize the country's economy by negotiating NAFTA, and Mexico City needed a, uh, a transformation that would reflect its highly sought first world status. Liberal reforms in government triggered real estate investment, which in turn favored conditions for the continued development of Santa Fe. The project, as envisioned, followed the global trends set by urban mega projects in such cities as Paris and, or London with La Defense or, or Dockland, respectively. For Camacho, the regente, having a large scale project that showed off his capacity to better position Mexico City in the, in the international arena, was of utmost importance as it contributed to building a platform for his presidential aspirations. The well known architects. Uh, Ricardo Legorreta and Teodoro González de León were commissioned to develop the master plan. It is relevant to note that while they were not experts in urban planning, they were the most highly regarded architects of the time. Since the idea of Santa Fe was to build 
uh, in each city, the architects were sent to Century City in California, seeking a clear vision of the kind of urban model they were being asked to develop. While serving met sales brochure described the master plan as a detailed and highlighted a rigid uh, zoning policy oriented to optimum land usage, the reality was that the architects delivered a highly schematic plan that was neither totally detailed nor finished. The master plan has, master plan has been severely criticized since it did not adhere to Mexican customs for the utilization of urban space. The initial master plan failed to be integrated into the pre-existing urban fabric. From the first drawings, an attempt was made to create a particular urban environment totally separated from the rest of the city. Zoning of the area was very specific with little mixed use, which resulted in an automobile-dependent urban plan. Santa Fe's concept is one of the, or is the one of an urban enclave. Long wide avenues run longitudinally, characterizing the urban grid. Only the Mexico Toluca Freeway, which divides the project into two, crosses over the mega project at a higher terrain level with no access to or from the area, making it impossible to access the mega project from transverse streets. All other longitudinal streets are dead ends or, or circular streets. Transverse streets are few, while many are cul-de-sacs or private roads, resulting in a disarticulated urban grid that promotes gated communities with dedicated streets, which forces, further reinforces the idea of an urban enclave. In 1989, with the first master plan finished, Servimets began commercializing the land and attracting, in, in, attracting investment to the area became imperative. Hence, models of the site were constructed to prevail upon developers to invest in Santa Fe and government officials embark on a mission to contract, contact transnational corporations along with um, real estate developers. The government successfully persuaded several investors who came on board and began constructing the first uh, office buildings in 92. Uh, during the economic boom that was generated by the neoliberal reforms implemented by Salina, um, in a climate of high optimism and uh, with the presidential promise of turning Mexico into a first world country, that seemed to be coming true. So nearly a third of the projects in existence today in Santa Fe were initiating during this time. The construction of the first office building began despite not having building permits or licensing due to the lack of infrastructure uh, due to lack of infrastructure and public services during the first years the building operated relied, relied on a generator to supply electricity mobile mile, mobile phones were used in place of landlines and water supplies was done by water trunk tanks uh, from 1990 Three, according to various developers, while invested in Santa Fe continued with more than 20 offers buildings being built, the government ceased allocating resources to the needed infrastructure. And what was in, in existence began to deteriorate. When new infra infrastructure was built, it was of very low quality and several as aspects of the project were not completed. The dreams and desires for a low global city started to collide with local realities. The master plans, models, sketches, and descriptions of the mega project were totally disconnected from the reality of what actually happened on the ground, illustrating that inserting a foreign urban model was not enough to produce a first world enclave in Mexico City. Even if the master plan imitated an American edge city at implementation, local conditions transformed the intended outcome. Local politics and deep, the, uh, deeply embedded corruption in the government influenced the built environment that was supposed to embody the global city. The difference between the government's promises and capacities were not evident until Santa Fe ceased to be the major priority and deeper level of corruption ensued. Another significant problem in the area is the lack of um, access, pr proper access routes. The main avenues to access the site do not have enough capacity to provide a small, uh, smooth access, resulting in serious traffic conge congestion uh, several times a day. Even with all these uh, setbacks, by 2006, 
the plots of the mega project were almost fully sold. Approximately 160 corporations have their offices in Santa Fe, such as Chrysler, Hewlett Packard, Ericsson, Citibank, IBM, General Electric, uh, etc. Since the objectives of this development was to promote global investment through the creation of a wide range um, ranging project that would not only house transnational companies, but also an American style shopping mall with services such as cafes, restaurants, and along with private schools and universities, hospitals, high-end gated communities and apartment buildings. Um, today, uh, most corporate office buildings, housing projects and shopping centers are being designed by transnational firms. And um, it is important to think of Santa Fe as viewed uh, as a part of a longer history of the of deep involvement of political figures and bureaucrats in urban development and landmark projects in Mexico City. Several politicians claim to be the authors of the idea of the development of Santa Fe, blaming previous or subsequent administration for Santa Fe's shortcomings, illustrating a lack of accountability distinctive to the polit Mexican political system. Given the extent to which Santa Fe is publicly regarded as an urban failure, none of the architects involved in the design of the master plan wants to be associated with the mega project today. The use of large-scale large urban projects in order to tell the story of the nation to the global community is by no means new or exclusive to Mexico City. What has changed throughout history is the conception of modernity and how to achieve it. Mega projects are only the most recent phenomena in a longer history in which politicians frequently build large and visible projects in order to show commitment to nation building and narrating not only the nation past but its future by reordering the cityscape. Even if Santa Fe was created with the intention of being a first world enclave in the city, this goal was impossible to achieve since the pre-existing conditions of, for its development seriously influenced the ways in which blueprints materialized and the resulting outcomes were determined. Mexico City's government throughout most of the 20th century have instituted urban initiatives in an authoritarian fashion by means of top-down top down urban planning. Therefore, it can be seen in the case of Santa Fe, the city's government followed the same approach, both in the development of the master plan and in the ways it was carried out. The resulting story is unfortunately entirely predictable since the disconnections between plans and realities are an ongoing narrative of Mexico City's urban history. At the moments in which the mega project was the priority for the regente or mayor, this entity had enough power to guarantee the smooth development of Santa Fe. However, as soon as the priorities were directed somewhere else, corruption became the primary power that drove the engine of development. The poor infrastructure resulting from fraudulent maneuvers became the main concern of investors who anticipated a drop in their assets value. Given the lack of accountability and the power both left by the agencies of the various governments, the investors, developers, and residents of Santa Fe took the situation in their, to their own hands. The fulfillment of the interests of these economic elites are leading to further privatization and segregation of Santa Fe, but not without contestation from excluded social groups. This analysis aims to shed light on the dynamics that shape the entrepreneurial city Learn, learning from mistaken choices is imperative. Mega projects have to often have often proven to be the result of a series of erroneous decisions, rather than seeing the outcomes as an accidental or intended. We must find and understand what is missing in the blueprints and their implementation, in the hope for learning um, or of learning from them. Therefore, the argument prevails that failing to fully understand the complexities of the local and the local being practices and actors, the global will always be unintended. Thank you. And now for our last panelist here in this session, uh, Maria Teresa Vasquez Castillo, presenting the U.S. Latin American City and the Latin American U.S. City, the cases of Mexico City and Los Angeles. Thank you. 
Um, I have to tell you that I started this research because I'm from Mexico City originally, and I live in LA. So I go back and forth, uh, and through the years, what I've been noticing is all these changes in both cities. And that's why the title is um, the U.S. Latin American City and the Latin American U.S. City and the cases of um, uh, Mexico City and L.A. Does the person change us? Yeah? No. Ah, en el teclado los, las flechitas. Okay. Um, I also would like to think or to ask you to think in the United States, not only in terms of LA, but in terms of all the United States and how different states have different Latin American populations. Like if we could place those populations in the map, you could see that in a way, not only LA, but the entire United States are representing different uh, uh, populations, different Latin American populations, like for example, Florida, uh, Cubans, uh, Colombians, Haitians, and California, Mexicans, and Central Americans. I'm just mentioning some of them and Massachusetts, Brazilians, in New Orleans, uh, people from Central America and the Caribbean, and evidently in New York, and I don't have to mention more other states. But I want you to visualize the United States and the different Latin American um, uh, groups that have gone through time to all these places. And I think that um, an effort to understand these trends historically and in academia and in policy has been not only uh, in LASA recently, a few years ago it has been created the US Latino track in Latin American studies, but also there was in 2008 the conference in Kansas, the Nuestra America in the United States, and actually I didn't uh, put there, there are many other conferences too, but um, in October of last year, the diverse suburb that also was trying to, that took place in uh, Hofstra University and that tried to uh, bring uh, this question that is not only in cities, but it's also happening in the suburbs and probably it's happening as some of you, I think that in the case of some of the papers here, in the case of rural areas and towns. And evidently, uh, thank you for, uh, to Clara for organizing the transnational Latin Americanisms that is yet another effort to try to understand these processes and open the conversation. And most than anything else, the thinking about it like it's something that we're uh, doing uh, uh, or starting to do um, now. Um, let me see. So what I'm going to do, well, how I started my presentation or my thinking, it was to do, uh, try to think, it's like, okay, how uh, the production of urban space in Latin American cities and in US cities has taken place, how uh, the influence of the United States in Latin American cities has been, and vice versa, and what is this thing? What is this concept of Latinization of LA or the Americanization of Mexico City? Um, and what that means for land, capital, labor, and urban planning? And then I'm going to try to draw some conclusions. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the Latinization of uh, LA, it's a concept that was developed by um, um, Mike Davis, Victor Valle, Rudy Torres, and it came out uh, a little bit before the 2000 census, but mostly when this demographer Frey was showing all over the United States his presentation about the Latinization of the United States with very fancy maps showing how the Latino population was going even to areas that it was not uh, a common destination uh, and that it had become a common destination. Um, 
in terms of the Americanization of Mexico City, I don't know if that's uh, really a term, like people are saying this is the Latin Americanization of Mexico City. I think that the discourse, uh, and probably you can also help me to rethink about this, is like the discourse has been mostly in how Latin American cities have adopted either planning ideas, have adopted urban form that changed through time and historically that urban form. Evidently, I'm talking about the Americanization because of the urban form or the homogenization of these, uh, of these um, elements. Uh, so my objectives was like, okay, why uh, was Mexico City looking how we think more Americanized, while Los, Los Angeles was looking more Latino? But not on, only that, every time I went to Mexico, I was just thinking, oh my God, it's like, how come Chicanos in LA are really striving to keep the culture or to recreate it? And how come Mexicans in Mexico City are following the opposite trend? What is happening? You know, and what elements are influencing the production of urban space in each metropolitan area? And were these processes, like I was saying, like how uh, uh, one process was going probably to be more Americanized and the other one to be more Mexican. What, what does these processes mean? What, uh, are these contradictory processes or are they closely interweaving? What's the meaning of these processes? Uh, so, I work with some hypotheses, and I change my hypothesis every time, like trying to grasp and trying to understand uh, or what, uh, what is happening. Um, I come from a background of uh, political economics, so for me, capital labor and uh, it's very important, the same as land and the same as urban planning ideas. I'm an urban planner too. Uh, so consequently for me, that was very important to see what was happening with capital, with investment, where it was going, what was happening with labor, what's happening with uh, the land, you know, and what's happening with the diffusion or not of urban planning ideas. Uh, the other hypothesis was, was the Latinization of US cities, an indicator of this Latin America in the United States and if the Americanization of Latin, Amer of Latin American cities was an evidence of the continuous presence of US in Latin America. A third hypothesis was the resistance of the United States to become Latin Americanized and seemingly a consent of Latin American cities to become more Americanized. Uh, probably I don't need to go through all the discourse of how different uh, urban planners or urban uh, sociologists or urbanists have conceptualized the production of urban space in Latin American cities. What it was interesting for me, it was most of these conceptualizations come from outside Latin America. And in Latin America, we have just case by case study. But it's not like we have gotten together and we have said it's like, okay, this is the generalization and probably because it's not possible, but probably something that we need to think. But regularly what we have is that uh, people use all the, the, the conceptualization of uh, Latin American cities uh, in terms of how also is conceptualized the famous third world city, like the rural urban migration, the irregular settlements, the informal housing, the lack of urban services, the unplanned urban growth, informal labor force, social movements, and then for Mexico, it seems that um, that was also the case. It was a study from below, from the grassroots to social movements, the role of informal settlements. And um, it was interesting for me, like now we see all these elements of Santa Fe, for example, in the case that was mentioned, 
um, that the middle and, inco and upper income housing in Mexico uh, is being built, you know, but regularly has, there are very few studies of how these two processes happen at the same time. What's happening when uh, Santa Fe has been built and what happened with the people that was there before? Where did they go? You know, so what's the process there? You know? um, and where and how the space has been allocated also for economic and commercial activities and what that means also for the city. What led to the geographic distribution in the city? Uh, for me, it was interesting to see the role of Latin America, of American cities. I teach this class on the growth and development of cities. Um, for me, it was interesting to see that um, many of my students uh, do, don't know the role of immigrants in the production of cities. And it was interesting also when I took them to field trips to downtown LA, because you would imagine that uh, students that go there because they live in LA, they have been into downtown LA. Well, wrong. Like, they have not been in downtown LA, many of them, and consequently, they don't know that there's a plaza. Very few of them know about La Placita Alvera, and I'm not talking about a uh, private school. This is a state on school. So for me, it was interesting to see how also the form of the city had to do how, with how students learn about American cities, and in this case, about LA. Um, so for me, it was important to talk about the production of, uh, of urban space, but to talk about from the point of view of also how immigrants have uh, build the city and the segregation as, uh, segregationist measures that have, or oh, in LA specifically, segregated them. You know, restricted covenants, the restrictions, redlining, all these elements that segregated the African American communities in other cities in the United States have a specificity in LA. What is happening there? Um, what I found is that most of the research it focus on urban space for above the capital. But you don't see in the history of LA except in that literature and that work that is um, done either by historians or uh, done in Chicano studies about the role of immigrant communities, and specifically in this case, about the role of Mexican communities. So the displacement and dispossession that took place in LA, you know, is not really visible, you know, because the role of these communities is not part of the history. You know, evidently, the indigenous and Mexican histories of LA are seldom mentioned, you know, one of the cases that is very documented, probably you know, is the case of Chavez Ravine, that it was the case of uh, this Mexican community that was displaced so that they could build the Deutscher Stadium. But aside from that, other displacements are not so well known. So definitely a transnational research agenda on the production of urban space that is taken into, apply, into, into consideration the transnational capital, the transnational migration, the planning ideas, the transnational spaces, and the impact on the built environment of Mexico City and, and LA, it's important. But I think that here, it, there's a consideration that I, uh, I would like to mention. Let me see. Oh, excuse me. I'm passing it, I'm not passing mine. <laughs> And, and that, that one important thing for me is history, definitely. Um, for I consider that waves of colonization um, are important in Mexico City, in LA. How Mexico City was part of the same territory, how LA was part of the same territory, and what that means, you know? Evidently, I'm not going to focus so much on Spanish uh, 
uh, the way of colonization Spanish, but it's interesting how some of the replication of spaces in LA, supposedly Chicano spaces, look very much like a Spanish architecture or a Spanish urban form. But, uh -huh. uh, but also I think that we need to think about, you know, there's a new wave of, if not colonization, definitely a, a strong influence of US into the urban form and into the displacement of uh, Mexico, uh, uh, of Mexicans. And because of that, I'm going to talk about the role of NAFTA. When we talk about immigrants, Mexican immigrants in the United States and transnationalism and their place and their culture or whatever, it seems kind of a celebration and that's fine. But I think that also we need to see at the structural process that are taking place. And one of them is that this population left in many cases because they didn't have jobs or because they were displaced from the land. There was a land, there, there was a land reform uh, before uh, at the beginning of the 19, I was you know, in the 1920 something after the Mexican revolution, but then when NAFTA was passed, there was all this economic restructuring that changed the land law. And if that land law before NAFTA kept populations in place, but after NAFTA they could sell the land, it was a way, or it opened the door for privatization of land and people migrate. Uh, before NAFTA, there was still, you know, although this land privatization was not there, there was a whole uh, area of the influence in urban form in places like Ciudad Satellite. I'm going to show you a, a, a picture. Ciudad Satellite is a place, it's a suburban place. El Pedregal de San Angel, that is one of the uh, most expensive areas in, um, in, well, not now, now it's Santa Fe, you know, but in, in Mexico City. Uh, Las Lomas, that is very close to Mexico City, to, to Santa Fe, and actually they connected, right? Because now we are connected to the most, uh, the most uh, expensive area. And Perisur, but that was before. But after, then what we have is the case that Maria and Garrett presented, that is um, the Santa Fe, the Plaza Loreto too, that it was changed, that the Plaza Loreto is this, um, factory that was converted and that now you go and really you don't know the history of what that industrial place used to be. Walmarts, and actually two weeks ago there was this huge uh, announcement from, just two minutes, okay, from uh, the, the, the Mexican government that said that there was going to be a huge investment probably to build what, 115 Walmarts. So you could imagine the impact that that's going to have in uh, Mexico and in Latin American city. The Starbucks everywhere, you know, 7-Elevens and what is now the historic core what you used to see, the drug stores or the liquor stores or whatever, you see the XOO, how do you pronounce it, you know, everywhere, you know. So definitely when you go to Mexico City and even when you go to the downtown core, what you see is a homogenization or a Americanization of uh, Mexico City. Evidently, that has seen an impact on culture and on practices. Uh, I'm going to show you in two minutes that I have the pictures and then I'm going to leave everything else for the discussion because I'm not going to have time. This is Ciudad Satellite and I think that it was important when somebody was mentioned that it's not only cities but this was the sub, you know. This was before um, NAFTA, it was uh, started building probably in the late 50s, you know, and but it was fully in place in the 1970s, you know, the suburban area. This is Perisur. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing it with, it's like I cannot see this one, okay. This is Perisur, this is one of the first malls, I think that the first mall in the southern part of Mexico City. And evidently in the most recent cases, the case that uh, was presented, uh, my Maria, uh, in the case of Santa Fe, this commercial and the housing district, 
and you see not only the EXO and the Walmarts and the um, McDonald's or whatever, but you see Starbucks everywhere. And here is like in one community people were protesting, you know, one of the Walmarts actually, probably you know about this famous case of a Walmart built next to uh, Teotihuacan that is one of the most famous anthropologi well, anthropological areas and there was a huge protest, you know. So I'm going to pass this because I want to go to the photographs of LA. Here you have the Plaza del Mariachi. That is kind of the, for those of you who have been in LA, you know, like it's like, uh, they, there's a plaza, mariachi is going to play there. It's like kind of the equivalent of Garibaldi, the Garibaldi Plaza. And actually, um, when um, it was mentioned that there was no public transportation, they are trying to commercialize these areas. There's now a new metro station that goes to La Plaza del Mariachi, and that connects with the rest of um, uh, LA. Plaza Mexico, actually, uh, it's very hard, you know, if you're in LA, it's very hard to go by public transportation, but if you walk 10 minutes, there's a metro station that goes to Plaza Mexico, you know? Uh, but may, most people, most people drive, you know? Plaza Mexico is an interesting case. I definitely agree with what say about Plaza Mexico. When I went there, I had the feeling that I was in Las Vegas for Mexicans. You know, they was like, oh my God, this is, you know, like when you're going to Las Vegas, you know, and it has like a, a theme, that's how I felt, it's like, oh, this is kind of Disney life for Mexicans, right? And evidently you see all this recreation, they even had Pancho Villa there, and they, I think that they even have some, uh, like a, a, a bust of um, um, Benito Juarez and anyway. But also, there's a very interesting process on transnational muralism and related to culture. You know, uh, well, just half a minute. <laughs> you have like this um, um, contestation in what's going to be preserved in LA. And what is happening is that many of the areas produced by the Chicano Latino community are erased. In a way, what I say is like these are like immigrant spaces that also have an immigrant, meaning probably a temporary life because they are not preserved and they are erased. This is a, it's a different case. This is America Tropical. This is a very famous mural by Siqueiros that was kind of rescued and it was covered when it was first painted because it depicted uh, an indigenous person crucified by imperialism. And this was painted right there in the Plaza de Los Angeles that is La Placita Olvera, you know? MacArthur Park, that I think that Gerardo here has a very interesting work on that. This is during the immigrant demonstrations. Plaza MacArthur, some say that it was like the Chapultepec of LA, that Chapultepec is the main, uh, um, the main uh, park. And then you have the South Central Farm, that is kind of the transnational agricultural space, you know? And evidently it says, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. And they didn't leave, but they, the police arrived and displaced them. And then tells you what is happening with the production of these spaces in LA, and that then they are left. And then, then I just want to, you to think again about this process of Mexico City and LA, about capital, you know, definitely Santa Fe and other mega projects are like the recipient of capital. They are spaces of the location of capital while you have here in LA the location of labor and the production of the spaces of labor, of immig immigrant spaces. I have some other um, slides, but I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to call the other panelists to sit down so that we can start our session discussion and follow on into the final discussion.
cabeza. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was very intrigued in why Clara invited me to moderate this section. I'm not Mexican, I don't study Mexico. I thought it was very audacious of her to say, come, come and, come and have a look, come and talk with us. And as I trust Clara, and I know she's a very serious academic, I thought she must know what she's doing. <laughs> so, and it was very, very interesting to have read uh, the group of four um, papers on Mexico City, basically, or the relationship of Mexico City with the US and the transnationalism implied in this, that I thought it, would it gave me a broader interpretation of what we can understand by transnationalism and transnational American, Latin Americanism. And what I have seen in the group of panels since yesterday is that what we have is a colorful cloth with different threads which can go through gender and race, which was yesterday morning or afternoon, housing, planning, architecture, art, the production of space, remittances, the changing colors and the changing colors of art, how cities change with the changing colors, transnational dense heterogeneous cities, and how the dual impact of Latin Americas in the US, Latin Americas in Spain, uh, and how this is building another color or another cloth for the world. The four papers which were presented specifically in the session gives us a very interesting picture of Mexico and Mexico City, or what we can call of Mexicanisms. It's a broad interpretation of Mexican culture through diverse lenses, internal and external, cinema and shopping malls in LA, politics of space and geographical imagination in the comprehension of cities. The first paper, Mexican Cities, which was written by Gareth Jones and Moreno Cajanco, discusses a matrix of questions related to the construction of images and imaginaries of Mexico and Mexico City through cinema. What is filmed? Where? how and financed by whom all sum up to the debate on visions and revisions of Mexico and Mexico City throughout the past century and maybe for the future. I read the paper recognizing names, Dolores Del Rio, famous throughout all of Latin America, Panchifas, which I remember of early childhoods, which was already old. Man. And at the same time, I also read the paper with a little notebook by my side, writing down names of new films I should see and I haven't seen. Yeah. And recognizing, which was most fascinating, patterns of production of cinema, which are, at least in Brazil, the Brazilian cinema, are almost the same, which are the cinema directed by designers and publicity and the way in which they sell the images, which in many times are images of nowhere. And Central do Brasil, which is a famous Walter Salles a cinema, is that depiction. You do not recognize any place, even though all the landscape images are from Brazil. But he does not depict a Brazil. And I understand that the discussion throughout the paper has very much this, uh, this accent on it. The second paper on Plaza Mexico on a, an LA mall written by Macarena Gomez Baris and Clara Irazaban discusses how culture reestablishes itself in a pri privatized environment, a shopping mall, where the creation and management of private places creates possibilities of heterogeneous ways in which people experience homeland in transnational settings. The privatization of public spaces Fear of home security in a city dispersed geographically as LA gives rise to an interesting phenomena of private public pro production of space in transnational setting in which religious manifestation occurs in midst of consumerism, transforming even if momentaneously a consumer location into an enchanted space. As the authors depict, Plaza Mexico, with all the strangeness involved, Korean-owned thematic mall, fulfills an important gap in Latino cultural life in LA, bringing into light the growing trend 
this is their, their, their phrase, the growing trend of displacing these events from the public realm and replacing them in private venues, indicating a tendency of all type of urban manifestation, be it Latino, be it even American, of not happening anymore in public spaces in the US. The Plaza Mexico is a point in a much bigger iceberg of what is becoming of public space and urban environment in the US. The third paper, Santa Fe Mega Project, by Maria Moreno Carranco, depicts the long political process of producing neoliberal space in Mexico. The paper interwines, which she didn't show a lot in the discussion, but was very interesting in the paper, personal politics with national and international politics on the financing and eventually producing neoliberal spaces in order for the country to be competitive and the city to be competitive. It, is also, it also shows that these processes are long and change characteristics as economic environment changes and how the building of neoliberal spaces is not homogeneously globally, but that different forms of globalizations are produced locally. One that is unique because it integrates the unavoidable local circumstances with the global aspiration. This paper leads my head to explore the impacts of little Manhattans throughout Latin America. The fourth and last paper presented and written by Teresa Vasquez shows us a double-handed influence of Latin America US cities and which points to a possible new agenda for studies in transnational Americanisms. A multi-layered, multi-scalar impact of transnational Latin Americanism on Latin America and in the US. US is more and more bilingual. I always like to remember that when we arrived here, my son, like six months ago, he didn't speak English, he didn't speak Spanish. Now he speaks English and Spanish. Yeah. You do not survive in most of the US cities if you don't speak Spanish. Yeah, you, can, you, will only, um, you will only feel half of the city, but if you want to understand the multi-layer of the city, you have to speak Spanish. Um, for which of us, the, the, the idea of this more bilingual, multicultural, um, environment in which being in the, wet, in the US puts us uh, in front um, and having the profession uh, most of us have as academics that we think things out. Now, we must ask ourselves, and that's my question and what I would like to hear, what are the new themes and new research methodologies that we could build new and innovative agenda for Latin American studies in the US? because Latin American study, Brazilian studies have been through the US Academy for a long time. What can we uh, think about as new proposals of Latin Americanisms in this dual, multi-layer, multi-scalar perspective? In order to make the debate more um, opened and have more people participating, I would like to collect a couple or three more questions, and then I could open it for you guys. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm an international student from Iran, Ecuador, and uh, I recently moved to New York. And I remember when I first started college. Uh, I remember when I first started college in 1990, at the end of the 90s. I remember going to a conference about my city, and um, someone. Uh, predicting what was going to happen to colonial Quito. And I remember all these academy people telling what is what's going to happen if we don't do something. Well, now, 11 years later, it happened. And the academy reported all. So I was wondering if all the proposals that we have listened today and yesterday have any, how does it work for the academia to connect with advocacy projects and to stop what is happening? Like, are there any of these projects connected to uh, community-based organization, grassroots movements? Where does this, all this information go to influence public policy? Yeah, I had a question for Clara Macarena. Um, so I'm, very, I'm definitely very interested in how, uh, 
how, how immigrants kind of create the sense of place. And it also, this question could also go to Maria as well. So I think there's this interesting kind of di divide in terms of creating uh, kind of organic spaces you know, for, for immigrant communities, or how immigrant communities go about creating organic spaces. Uh, whereas I think what you've shown in the Plaza Mexico example is this almost superimposed uh, uh, development that, that helped create this, this sense of culture. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about the distinction there. Uh, you know, whether this type of development was more, you know, to what extent was it a true kind of Mexican development, or to what extent was it controlled from, from other cultural viewpoints? Uh, and within that, if you could talk a little bit about the relationships between, uh, between the Korean developers uh, and that space, and whether there was any conflict at, at any point. I think the, the first question that, that was raised um, about how academia relates to specific practices, it's, it's an important one that I assume that the panel will address, but it's something that I'm very interested in. And I have a kind of a comment or a question following up of what Gerardo just said. Um, if I were to look at some of the presentations and maybe Plaza Mexico, Plaza Mexico in particular, from my Northern California progressive Berkeley perspective, one could see that as a very kind of typical case of capital appropriation of exploitation of immigrants as a way to expand uh, new forms of profit generation. But uh, the presentation and some of the other papers suggest other levels of complexity that uh, raise a number of questions for me. On one hand, uh, is it really capital appropriating culture and place, or is it people and culture appropriating a private situation to make it public and to make it their own? Um, is the question, and I don't know if uh, Macarena and, and um, Clara were kind of teasing us with some of those concepts, but I felt like the same way that the concept of appropriation went back and forth, the same thing with authentic. Um, it almost seems irrelevant to talk about immigrants. These are people who are making the place their own. And it's hard for me to comprehend because maybe I don't relate to all the elements, but the way exchange and Retail is mixed with religion, it's mixed with entertainment, it mixed with flirting. It's a very complex setting that it seems extremely rich uh, and made me think that it's probably something more than just capital appropriation, but I'm not completely clear. So if you can elaborate on that and kind of also what do you see that as the implications if those kind of situations were reproduced throughout LA. Um, what kind of city are we facing? I mean, it seems on one hand that it could be really authentic, but not thinking in terms of immigrants or Mexicans or uh, an angelinos, but just people who are, are kind of embracing what they have in front of them in some kind of collective. Uh, well, um, I figure uh, we Brazilian researchers have an interesting challenge to handle with, which consists in how to incorporate Latin Americanisms in our research in questions, considering, considering we mainly use to do not consider ourselves as Latin American. <laughs> Almost uh, we use to consider Latin American people not as us, but as others. I'd like to hear your comments about this. Well, there are so many interesting questions on the table, and I think um, the, 
the issue of uh, advocacy work and relationships with NGOs and activist organizations so central. I mean, this project that Glad and I have been doing grows out of work that we had originally conceptualized as part of Latino New Urbanism and kind of closely connected to trying to have Los Angeles and the larger metropolitan area think very carefully through development strategies that would be more mixed use and all of the new urbanist practices that, you know, we know about. And, um, you know, as we began to do that work and work with uh, politicians, et cetera, we realized that, that we were getting away from some of our initial concerns and that we were more interested in a kind of uh, vernacular practice and the way in which not only people structured their homes, but where people were gathering. And these other two projects, the Bounded Tourism Project and the Project on Plaza Mexico, really grew out of an organic sense. Um, but, you know, I think Clara should also speak much more directly because she was very involved when in Los Angeles with the South Central Farmers and a very, very important experience of political mobilization and um, connections between kind of intellectual, quote unquote, you know, public intellectual practice and advocacy work. Um, you know, in terms of thinking more carefully about your question uh, regarding the, um, you know, the, the clientele and the managers and how we can think through some of those things. For us, methodologically, it was actually quite complex to do some of the work at Plaza Mexico. We had to get all kinds of special permission. Um, the Korean investors themselves don't want to, in fact, be located uh, with any, any kind of controversy and maintain a very, very low profile. And so there was much discussion of uh, where would your work be published? Who would know about this? We couldn't get access, actually, to interviewing them. We only got uh, mid-level access to one of the, the managers and she was very, very careful about her discourse. So part of the answer to your question is, is there controversy? Not much. And in fact, because the reason, um, you know, there is a kind of containment strategy by the management to not actually divulge their position, their investments, et cetera, at the same time, there is this kind of strategic appropriation, right, of, of all kinds of forms of identity. Um, I don't know, if Clara, if you wanted to address that question more carefully, but maybe should I go to Miriam's um, your question? Um, I think you're right, um, Miriam, to notice the, the ways in which we don't settle one way or the other on um, what, kind, what, what this mounts up to. What does Plaza Mexico mount up to? And for me, I think that's part of a kind of theor theoretical practice, and I'd love to hear from Clara, but I really think about like Benjamin in this and um, kind of moments or ruptures or fragments or fissures within this, you know, we could create a totalizing framework where we suggested, for instance, that this is indeed yet again the flexibility of late capitalism to incorporate all kinds of niche markets and, and reproduce them. But I think in some ways it was so important for us to start from practice or moments. And that's why we did so much ethnography and that's why that kind of grounded methodology was important to us to kind of understand, well, yeah, I mean, these are places of cruising, you know, these are places of, you know, where women talked a lot about using the altar to educate their, you know, children that get away from them in the barrios, they can bring them here and, you know, show them the pancito de la muerte or whatever. So it's not, there's no totality here. There's so many things happening in that space precisely. Um, and there were moments where we were absolutely, you know, what is the white Santa Claus doing here with the Virgen and people taking pictures with the, you know, the Santa Claus. And so I think that's why it was important for us to think of a kind of multi-method approach and again, to go back to Benjamin, that there were moments where we were literally forced to stop and the kind of uh, uh, something burst open, like when talking with those young gang members and they said, this is safety, man, you know, this is safety. Or it allowed us to kind of break through and really realize the extent to which in the last five years, I think, we've just seen a total, total destruction of Latino cultural centers. I mean, I talked about it very briefly and we talked about it in the paper, but the Achucha, self-help graphics, on and on, these locations of independent Latino cultural life that have a really long genealogy and a long, go back to Chicano moratorium, they go back to really strong political movements in Los Angeles that in fact, they've been totally dismantled. So it forced us also to encounter 
the lack of independent spaces and, you know, other spaces opening up, Nopal and other places, but um, really that this becomes this, this location that, what is happening here? Is anything happening here? That was kind of our question, right? So, yeah. Well, just to reinforce a little bit more what Macarena just said, is Plaza Mexico a capital, an instance of capital appropriation of culture or vice versa? I think it is neither one or the other, and it's actually both one and the other. It's a lot more complicated than we envisioned it to be when, it, when we started our exploration of it, and we're not uh, ready to make it any final judgment on that because it's evolving before our eyes. Uh, we, didn't have, uh, we didn't have time to mention, for example, that now some of these very same places that Milena referred to yesterday that were, that were selling houses elsewhere in, in Central American nations and Mexico, etc., are now taking place in Plaza Mexico as well. They are selling uh, cars, they are selling electronics of all sorts, um, housing appliances of all sorts. So it's, it's something that continues a reinvention of itself as our communities become ever more transnational. But they, uh, Plaza Mexico really represents the tragedy of the lack of urbanity in Los Angeles, something that is also uh, the nature of many other cities in the States and elsewhere. So it is, I think, Los Angeles is much better off because it has Plaza Mexico, but Plaza Mexico is not the ideal condition. It's, it's, it's just a band-aid over something that is really, really wrong at a structural level, and that needs to be solved at this structural level that will bring about different planning regulations and practices that will provide for spaces of community building that are outside of the purview and management of the private sector. We do not have that. The spaces that were available are disappearing before our eyes. And then the best net thing is Plaza Mexico that is appropriated by the community in very interesting and empowering ways, not just for religious and, and uh, uh, musical celebrations, but also for uh, health fairs, citizen fairs, and things of the sort that are, that are indeed very empowering and, and that build community in a place where there are very little opportunities to do that elsewhere. I want to give a shot to the question of where do we go, where do we go from here in terms of Latin American studies. Um, uh, during the break, we were conversing with uh, Marcela Tobar, and she was proposing that we had to decenter Latin American studies from these area studies that have come to be in 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 our universities here in the states so we really have to appropriate it back to all of the different disciplines and fields that we represent and uh, have this conversation become a lot more multidisciplinary it is multidisciplinarity i think i would argue the first thing that could save us and promote us to the next level as we tackle more complex issues with the realization of the level of transnationalism that we now have, et cetera, et cetera. So multidisciplinary would be my first shot. Then also following on what uh, Farhan Akhmirastav said yesterday, we need a lot more multi-sided ethnography to make sense of the new realities that we are facing and to realize and unfold and unpack their transnationalisms and then we need to work at the intersections of themes. Tatiana is asking, what are the new themes? And I would argue we don't need new themes. We need to continue deepening our understandings of the current themes, particularly with the strategy of working at the intersections of them. So continue working on gender, ethnicity, race, space, uh, poverty, inequality, all the things that interest you, but rather at the interstices, at the liminal places that have been underexplored or unexplored so far, where I think uh, the opportunities to better explain the complexities, the interrelations, 
uh, of these new realities lay. Okay. Uh, I, well, I will try to address a bit uh, um, the question about how is this information going to influence public policy? And uh, at the university that I work for, uh, the uh, Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico City, we have a lab that is called uh, Social Territorial Studies Lab. And surprisingly, the, govern the city government has approached us lately uh, because they need several, pro they, they don't know many things <laughs> that for us are kind of obvious. So we are being hired to do uh, a project on real estate, another one on security, and an analysis of how uh, Santa Fe works at the, the metropolitan level. So um, I don't know what will be the outcome of this, but at least we are being given the opportunity to try to propose new things. So I think that is a positive uh, thing. This was the last again. <laughs> but I'm going to try to answer slowly. Um, in terms of what is next um, discipline-wise, I think that one question is, we need to wonder where does Latin, Latin America end? Uh, what is, what does this migration mean? That when Latin Americans move, then when they cross the border, Latin America ended? where the border is, or Latin America expanded and continues because of the movement of people of labor and with them their cultural practices. Um, even if those spaces that they are going to be creating in their new territories are going to be either temporary or um, permanent, I think that another question that could be the agenda is who's resisting these processes? Who's resisting uh, the Latinization in different places? You know, there's an, a response, not only in the United States, but worldwide, you know, all these nativist and nationalist movement, you know, in the United States, the Minute Men, the SOS movement, in, uh, in Italy, you know, like the, the emergence of the fascist groups, the new rights everywhere. So what does that mean? I mean, it's like, it seems that it's happening, but there are responses. There are responses from these, um, from these forces, you know, that are resistant, you know, or who's supporting it, or who's uh, consenting it. No. Um, and I think that there are different levels. Um, and I think that one level is the one that you're observing right in front of your eyes, you know? And that's the role also of transnational academics, you know? And some of us, we have it easy, and some of us, we don't, because of many different issues too you know, of what we study or how we studied it and who we are, you know, and what we have to say and who's resisting what we have to say and who's resisting us here in new spaces, you know. Um, so I would like to ask you back, uh, advocacy to stop what is happening. What was in your mind when you were asking that, stopping in what?
about uh, Macarena's answer to Miriam's question. And I was thinking about uh, some of the things that I mentioned in, in, in my talk. Uh, I, 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 I don't know if you have explored the articulation theory and how Hall and um, Crossberg try to resolve this problem of what is it? What's before, what's then? What's authenticity again? And how that question becomes sec co completely secondary and how we can think about those spaces and collectives as ensembles and which have the ability to joint and disjoint different elements, and that's why Papa Noel is, is besides um, La Guadalupana, right? And we are trying to actually understand that with a, with a complete different framework that won't allow us to understand it. But I find especially useful this idea of ensembles that joint and disjoint element, di disparate elements, right? That allow people to hook and unhook from different spaces and simultaneously creating different identities. So I think that the production of difference in those spaces is what matters rather than trying to understand from a more fixed theoretical point of view those issues. So I think that's, that, that's really enlightening and, and that's something that anthropology has brought and I think that Clara has put it really, really well into this uh, discussion, these two days. Um, so yeah, maybe a more mobile thing, right? In terms of identity, in terms of creating difference, et cetera, will, will allow us or help us to start opening up issues. Yeah, uh, about Miriam's uh, question, uh, the appropriation of space. Um, I thought that the case of Plaza Mexico was very interesting because people don't see it, don't conceptualize it as a mall, you know? And that's the thing, because if you realize how malls are used, not only in the United States, but worldwide, is that is this private property that has a public use, yeah. And if we are able to conceptualize, like, you know, Plaza Mexico, yeah, it's a replication of all these, like, uh, uh, Langel de la Independencia, and Pancho Villa there, um, the fountain or whatever. But basically, you know, that's why I said that it was a theme. But basically, it's this private area that is being appropriated by the People, the same as people in other malls, go and hang out there and appropriate it publicly, you know, to function. It, uh, you know, although definitely this has all these cultural connotations, but people decide to go to this mall that is Plaza Mexico and appropriate it not only in terms of public space but also in terms of uh, cultural space. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. What no, can I, I just want to respond to the last two comments. I mean, I think you're right that it's a, definitely in the case of Plaza Mexico, but I think about mall space in very uh, quickly liberalized context, like the kind of fundamentalisms of Chile or Argentina in you know transition to political democracy. And there, the mall functions quite differently, I would suggest. And obviously, it's heterogeneous, and we have to be very contextual about our responses. Um, and historically based, but in many cases, like uh, in Uruguay, and um, for instance, there's a case of a mall that was built right on top of a torture center. That's also the case in, in many places in Chile, where these large uh, shopping centers will be function as forms of amnesia. Mm -hmm. So the mall, you know, and then in, in Upper Barrios or whatever, so you get, um, rather than this kind of sedimented public expression, you get forms of kind of uh, amnesia, of erasing the past, of things that go in line with official discourses and official narratives, and the mall becomes a site of this kind of celebration of economic globalization that actually has obliterated all kinds of forms of historical memory. So I think you're right, in, and I guess I wanted to point out something else that I think is very, very important in your presentation, and that is 
the way the function of the um, you know eradication um, of Article 27 and the Hilo system really served as a an, you know mobile mobilizing structural factor for populations, especially indigenous peoples, to be displaced and then come to something like Los Angeles. And what we saw was the effects of that, where um, all kinds of heterogeneous uh, indigenous populations from southern Mexico were actually quite tied to their identities. And this is something I think I want to have a conversation with you about further, Marcelo, which is I absolutely love that kind of fluidity and way in which you are thinking about the ensemble and Hall's notion of articulation, that that can be articulated, can also be disarticulated. And, um, but I just wonder, in the case of these particular uh, structural moments where we do have this this real, you know, we do have Salinas, we have, you know, the 92, the Zapatista 94, et cetera, you know, all of the things that happen in the disarticulation of, of um, a really important communal land system. And then the rearticulation of those identities in the U.S., that is a very fixed notion of identity. It's mobile, but what do you, I mean, how can we then employ the idea of ensemble there. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's a it's a genuine question that I'm struggling with around indigenous identity, its representation um, in these global sites, but also it's it's rooted. I don't want to say rooted cosmopolitanism, but it's rootedness. You know what? Those things seem to be a little bit. Do you know what I'm saying, Marcella? Do you have an answer for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. It, let's it's a genuine. Anyway. I think we should. Okay finish the session because we'll, we can have a quick break and then we're going to have more general discussion. Probably that question won't be answered, but you can talk later. But before I finish the section, the session, I would like to thank Clara, not only for organizing this interesting um, seminar, but organizing and keeping a big smile on your face. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, 15 minutes break and Clara will come back.